Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoko welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. The Amazon is burning. Unfortunately, that is not new news. So maybe the headline of this conversation ought to be the burning Amazon may be rapidly approaching a tipping point. My guest today is uniquely positioned to explain what that means, why it matters, and who needs to do what now. Andre Guimaraes is executive director of IPAM Amazonia, one of the premier research organizations studying the Amazon and worrying about its future. Welcome, Andre. Thank you, Alan. It's very nice to be here with you. Before we get to the tipping point, let's set the stage. Why is the Amazon so critical in the global context of how the climate works? Well, um, let's put the Amazon in perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the trunks, the trees, the leaves and the roots of the, the trees in the Amazon, they store the equivalent to about 10 years of human global carbon emissions. So that gives the perspective of how important the, the, the maintenance of the integrity of the Amazon is to mankind to achieve the, the objectives of the Paris Agreement when it comes to reducing uh, carbon emissions and, and coping with the challenges of climate change. That, that's on one hand. So on the other hand, the Amazon stores somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of all the solutions that life has found to inhabit this planet over the past three billion years. So the Amazon is fundamental to cope with challenges surrounding climate change. It's fundamental to store the biodiversity that will certainly be necessary for our lives in the future, for new medicines, for new food, for new uh, solutions for, for our lives, they are stored in the Amazon. But last but not least, I think the Amazon is, is fundamental for food security, for global food security. Brazil is, is responsible for feeding somewhere around 1 to 1.2 billion people every day. And we do that, among other things, because we have free rain out of the Amazon to irrigate our crops. So the Amazon, once again, is fundamental to a number of reasons, and including uh, food security globally. So the integrity of the Amazon is something that is, it should be out of discussion. We have to stop deforestation now, and we have to restore some, some areas in the Amazon so that we keep that integrity at the service of humans uh, for the future. This has been another bad year for fires in the Amazon. The numbers I've seen released in the last couple of days by the official Brazilian sources suggest that this is worse than last year. And last year, of course, was worse than the prior year. What's happening in the Amazon today? Well, as, as, as you might know, I mean, we have a new government. He was elected back in 2018. So this is the second year of this, this administration, the federal government that we have in Brazil of President Bolsonaro. And this government has a clear orientation, uh, which I don't agree with, by the way, but it's a clear orientation towards the business as usual model of development, which is, in other words, expansion of the frontier. So the current administration of Brazil understands that development includes or is based on the expansion of the frontier. So more areas uh, incorporated in, in production systems means more development for the country. This, in my opinion, is an outdated methodology. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't only go for Brazil. It also goes for other regions. It goes for other tropical regions. We need to stop deforestation and we need to intensify the production. We need to replace the paradigm of expansionism to a new paradigm of intensification. And that's where governments are fundamental. Governments have to create the new incentives so folks on the ground, farmers, ranchers, forest uh, managers and so on, they do intensify their production instead of buying new land to extensify their production. So the current administration of Brazil, as I said, is outdated. This, this vision is outdated. Well, I would expect, you know, if they listen to science, they will renew the vision that they have towards the, the natural systems of Brazil. Uh, but being realistic, I think we'll have to wait for another couple of years to this government to be replaced by another one. Let me push and be precise. You're arguing that intensive development can replace extensive development, produce as much food 
as much product uh, with less of a footprint in the Amazon. Yes, correct. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. Brazil has about 180 million hectares of pasture land and about 180 million animals in that pasture land. So we have a, a, an average of one head per hectare. That's the average of Brazil, right? Uh, with a little bit of technology. And I'm not talking here rocket science. I'm talking nitrogen for the pasture land. I'm talking fences, a little bit of, of, of capacity building for the employees and, and uh, you know, a, a house for the animals. With that investment, you can, you, you can move from one to three heads per hectare. So we can triple the, 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 the herd of, of cattle in Brazil without chopping a single tree. It's just a matter of redirecting the, the incentives and the subsidies in that direction instead of subsidizing the deforestation, which we are still doing today. That's the upside. The downside is this concept of a tipping point. Uh, Thomas Lovejoy and Carlos Nobre recently wrote what I found to be among the most scary things I've read in a long time an article that argued that we are very close to the threshold where the conversion of tropical rainforest to dry savanna or even desert could be irreversible. How worried are you that we are nearing that threshold? Uh, I think every single inhabitant, human inhabitant of this planet should be scared to death of, of us uh, reaching that point. The Amazon is the single largest tropical forest in the world. It's, it's about half of the tropical forest in the world is in the Amazon. As I said before, it's crucial for biodiversity conservation. It's crucial for the carbon cycles. It's fundamental for the water cycles. If we hit the, the tipping point, and there's a big debate if this tipping point is 20% of the forest cleared, 25%, some would say that it's 30%. Honestly, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we are going in the direction of the tipping point and we have to stop that, that, uh, that path. We have to stop going in that direction. So in other words, we have to stop deforestation. What we have seen over the past six to seven years is a constant increase little by little in the deforestation. We have to revert this trend immediately. Otherwise, we are going to lose biodiversity. We are losing already. But we'll, we'll, we may affect the water cycles, which may affect the food production, which may affect food security globally. And that's why I say every single inhabitant of this planet should be concerned, worried, and against the Amazon hitting its tipping point. To be precise again, I've seen numbers suggesting that 20% of the Brazilian Amazon has been deforested. Is that a rough order of magnitude number to think about? Uh, we, we are actually close to 20%. Uh, it's about 18 to 19% has already been deforested. So in this, this, uh, some of these areas are suitable for reforestation. Some of these areas are suitable for agriculture and ranching. The challenge here is to channel the incentives so that the, the already cleared areas are used on a more efficient manner, generating the necessary jobs, the income, the GDP that is necessary for Brazil to grow and thrive, important, but doing that in the already cleared areas and not expanding the frontier anymore. Once again, uh, some scientists, most scientists would say that the tipping point is of the Amazon is between 20 and 25 percent of deforestation. We are very close to this point and we can't get to this point. So deforestation, stopping deforestation is urgent. It has to happen now. So we can't get to it, but we might. What happens if people don't listen to your arguments and the next time we talk in a year or two, it's at 20 percent or 22 percent? What, what does a tipping point world look like? What are the consequences for Brazil, for your neighbors, for the Americas? Mm -hmm. um, once again, uh, water cycles in the Americas depend upon the Amazon. So the Amazon is a centerpiece in water cycles. So rain in the Caribbean, uh, water cycles in, in the southern part of, of South America, Argentina, Paraguay, all of those countries are influenced by the water cycles that is promoted by, by the Amazon. So affecting rain in that region means that a substantial portion of the food production in the world would be affected. Argentina and Brazil together 
they, they produce around 70% of the soybean of the world. A substantial portion of the wheat is produced in these two countries. Corn is also very important. Beef is also crucial. So all of these crops and, and, and animals, they depend upon the, the natural water cycles, which are going to be affected. Actually, they are already being affected by the deforestation in the Amazon. And if we cross the tipping point, we will alter those systems in a dimension that may affect substantially the production and once again, food security globally. The entire world is and should be concerned about the hitting the tipping point in the Amazon. But more than that, I think looking at the future, we are losing biodiversity that we don't even know of. We are losing probably solutions for alternative foods for the, the population in the future that we don't even know of. We may be killing uh, biodiversity or eliminating biodiversity that will be important for the industry of the future, for biomimetics. So let's talk about solutions. Ultimately, that means politics, and it means politics in Brazil, in South America, in the Amazon basin itself, uh, and more broadly than that. In Brazil, certainly elements of the national security establishment and the military have forever been deeply worried about the security of Brazil's northern border and have argued that uh, the new highways, the new dams, the new construction, the extensive development, the population of the Amazon as though it were not populated already, the, the new population of the Amazon is essential to Brazil's national security. Why is that argument wrong? Well, that argument, at some extent, is correct. Uh, it's important to, to mention that the, the military governments back in the 60s and 70s in Brazil, when you have the dictatorship, the military dictatorship, they were the very first governments that made a plan for the Amazon. So the big dams, the highways, the big mining projects in the Amazon that are still there, they were designed and, 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 and partially implemented by the military government back in the 60s and the 70s. They had a vision. They had a vision of occupy the Amazon so that we are not we, we protect our sovereignty. So that was the vision of the military back in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, the militaries uh, are very, very powerful in this, this current administration. Uh, they are present in ministries and very close to the president. The president of Brazil himself is a former military, so he has this military behavior and vision over Brazilian sovereignty and etc. So I think the, the vision and the, the presence of the military forces in the Amazon is a, is a fundamental piece of protecting not just the Brazilian sovereignty as they preconize, but also the, the, the integrity of the Amazon. The military, they, they do know the Amazon. They are present. They do control the borders. They have indigenous uh, populations as uh, military people in the Amazon. So they have intelligence, they have information, they have data. But the challenge here is to associate this, uh, in my opinion, uh, outdated vision of the military that is a, a sovereignty vision of the Amazon and contaminate that vision positively with science so that at the same time we can protect the integrity of the Brazilian territory, which is the vision of the military, and at the same time protect the, 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 the environmental services like water cycles and the biodiversity, which are fundamental for the, the current and the future generations. So I think the military, in short, they are, yes, be part of the solution, but they need to be positively contaminated with, with new information about the strategic importance of the Amazon, not just for Brazil, but for the globe. There is this outside Brazil, this notion that if the Brazilians don't solve the problem, somebody has to. Personally, I find that incredibly dangerous and not helpful at all. How do you, as a Brazilian scientist, trying to get policy on the right track, how do you, what do you want from the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. I think the entire world uh, benefits from the maintenance of the integrity of the Amazon. So somehow, the entire world should participate in the solution of the problem. The solution of the deforestation in, in the Amazon is, is expensive. So you need to monitor you need to punish, you need to, you know, destroy equipment of, of uh, you know, uh, land grabbers and, and, and other illegal bodies in the Amazon. You have to do that on a permanent basis. Uh, the Amazon is an enormous territory. It's about the size of the continental United States. You know, there's only 20 to 25 million people living in that territory. 
which is huge. So it's hard and expensive. Uh, on one hand, you have to deal with illegal deforestation, and that's the mandate of the government. On the other hand, you have uh, part of the deforestation or part of the Amazon can be legally deforested. So if I'm a farmer in the Amazon, I have the right to, to cut up to 20% of my property. Some properties have reached that point. Some properties have gone beyond that point. So they have what we call assets, which can be legally deforested. And in order to avoid that, one way that we are trying to do that at IPAM, that we believe that is, is a solution, is to compensate those farmers for not uh, clearing those areas that they are eligible or, or, or that, that they, they can do under the Brazilian law. But once again, whether it is uh, action from the state, whether it is incentives for the private sector, compensation or investments are needed. Capital is needed in order to do that. And, you know, it can't be blamed only on Brazil and Colombia and Ecuador, the Amazonian countries, their responsibility to cope with all those costs. So I think it's important for the, the, the international community to engage with Brazil in a positive agenda to uh, you know, somehow finance the monitoring and enforcement of the law in the Amazon. And at the same time, to help Brazil and other countries to create the right incentives to avoid the potentially legal deforestation that exists not just in Brazil, but in other countries too. So once again, money is needed. So I think cooperation, dialogue, integration, uh, partnership, those are the ingredients to solve the problem. Protecting the Amazon will benefit the entire globe based on food security and climate change mitigation, as I mentioned before. My concern, listening to you, watching what's going on in the Amazon, is that we maybe we'll have the same conversation a year or two or three from now where that deforestation line creeps towards the tipping point. There's a lot of gnashing of teeth and rending of garments, but not very much action. How do we get action? Um, if you look back in early 90s when IPAM was founded and many other organizations also, uh, we had less than 10% of the Amazon was protected under indigenous territories and uh, conservation units. Today, in 2020, we have about half of the Amazon. 50% of the Amazon is under some form of protection, whether it is indigenous territories, protected areas, parks, reserves, etc. So that's a success story. But that was an engagement between NGOs and scientific institutions and governments. What, what brings me hope, Alan, is the fact that the markets and the private sector is stepping into the debate. We know now things that we didn't know five, 10 years ago, right? That all the, the changes in, in the rain systems may affect the productivity, the agricultural productivity in some areas, making the installments or the, the implementation of, of these huge silos, for example, to store grains unfeasible anymore. So there, there are risks for investors. There are risks for the markets in continuing the, 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 the process of deforestation in the Amazon. So, and this, this is new, right? As, as we have seen over the past few months, manifestations from investors globally, from Brazilian banks, from Brazilian more than 80 CEOs of large corporations in Brazil signing letters of concern about what's happening in the Amazon to the Brazilian government. I think this is extremely new. What my, my perception is that finally the private sector has realized that they are facing at the same time a number of opportunities to turn around the, the global economy to being more green, but at the same time, a number of new risks associated to climate change and the, the, the local impact of climate change, like changes in rain systems and so on, which they weren't aware of in the past. This is extremely new, both the understanding of this phenomena and the engagement of the private sector, both the science that allows us to understand better the risk that we are associating ourselves with if we continue the deforestation and the engagement of the markets and the private sector, these two factors combined gives me the hope that in the, in the short term, in the future, we'll come up with the solution, which is basically the end of deforestation. It does seem to me that this is a unique opportunity for the Brazilian government. This requires a diplomatic solution, but I think they probably need a little bit of an encouragement. So I hope this is one of the roles that, that you and your colleagues continue to play.
doing our best here, Alan, and 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 definitely, you know, the the the, the solution needs engagement. It needs, and I think honestly that the the, the Brazilian government is missing an enormous opportunity because uh, you know the world when they when the investors, global investors, send letters to Brazil to the government of Brazil saying that they are concerned with the Amazon. We can see it from a half full or a half empty glass perspective. The half empty glass is, oh my God, the world is against Brazil, is criticizing Brazil, we're going to lose markets, we're going to lose investments. That's the half empty vision. The half full vision is that, well, the world is interested in what we have here and we should create the, the means and the, the reputation so that the world can come in and work with us towards the solution. So, you know, you can see interest as a criticism or a legitimate interest in participating in the solution. And that's where I think the Brazilian government is losing an opportunity. Instead of trying to, to, to show that the, the, the world is wrong when they see on TV the forest burning and the government of Brazil tries to convince them that the forest is not burning and that's impossible, instead of doing that, they should assume that we have a problem. They should design a process to, to, to stop deforestation and solve the problem and invite the world, especially the private sector, to participate in the solution. So this is the proposal you should make? At the end of the day, Alan, the, the, the solution uh, requires credibility, requires you know, openness to dialogue, requires you know, transparency in information, you know, and, and, and most importantly, requires cooperation. This is, this is not a simple problem. It's not a complex problem either, uh, but it, it requires engagement from different people. This is going to affect us all. You know, food is, is going to be more expensive in the future if we degrade the Amazon. Probably medicines to solve the future pandemics, uh, you know, will be gone in the fire if we don't pay attention to what's happening in the Amazon. So basically, we are telling our kids and our grandkids that we don't care with them when we burn the Amazon. This, this is something that can't happen anymore. Brazil is probably one of the, the largest producers and exporters of environmental services to the world. It helps the world in, in, in terms of keeping the temperature low. It helps the world help the world in the water cycles that comes from the Amazon and other biomes. You know, it helps and it promotes benefits to the world in, in storing the biodiversity, which may benefit the future generations. All of that you know, should be observed by the, the, by the international community, not just as a, as from, a, from a risk perspective, uh, which is already uh, happening, but also from an opportunity perspective. Protecting the Amazon it may generate benefits for everybody. So let's go and work together with the government of Brazil, the government of Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Guyana, etc., to come up with a solution. It's not written. It's not the, 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 the manual is not put together yet. We need to work together to design the manual and implement the solution for the deforestation of tropical forests in the world as a whole. The Amazon being the, the top of the, of, the, of the hill. The top of the hill and the most urgent part of the hill. So thank you, thank you very much, Andre, for this conversation, as well as for the work that you and your colleagues, Eddie Palm, are doing. Thank you, Alan, for the opportunity to talk to your audience about this fundamental piece of our fragile planet, which is the Amazon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.